If you want to take the energy away from a negative trope, you have to find something which is adjacent to it in a better direction and make that stronger. You don't talk about the problem directly, you approach it indirectly. Now, anybody got teenage children? Uh, you know about this then, right? You never tackle a problem directly, it won't work, right? You tackle problems indirectly by creating alternative attractor mechanisms, if you want the scientific language for it, all right? Uh, basically, you manipulate the little bastards, all right? If you want the scientific language, you create alternative attractor wells in adjacent possibles, all right? But manipulate the little bastards seems to me to be better, right, in that sense. So that's kind of like key statement number one, right? Now, that's actually, as I say, the same happens in companies. Beliefs arise in companies. And you can trigger them with the best of intentions. So if in a modern organization, you basically say, I can guarantee nobody will be made redundant, everybody will go and polish off their CVs. Because everybody's heard that promise before. And they know it always preceded redundancies. If you announce an organizational change initiative or a knowledge management initiative, you guarantee that it will fail. Because basically, people have been through a series of such initiatives in the past. They've nearly all failed to deliver their promise. So immediately, you trigger the memories of the past practice, and people behave accordingly. Of course, you don't see it, because people are very intelligent. Right? I'll give you an example from my IBM past. Right? So I was um, working in IBM headquarters. We were working on complexity. Um, and IBM changed its chief executive. This is kind of like when I knew I was going to have to leave. Lou Gerster was fun. Sam was very different, right? Um, and they changed from the brand, went from e-this to on-demand this. Anybody remember that change? Okay, now this is nothing whatsoever to do with brand needs, all right? This is all to do with a new alpha male needing to piss all over the trees to display possession. Most brand changes are about that, all right? So there was no reason to change it, but this is the new IBM, right? So now we're on-demand. So I had a board meeting, and somebody turned to me and said, oh, you're doing this complexity stuff. What do you think about the on-demand campaign? And I got really angry, because I'd spent the last six months working on this bloody thing. And it was fairly obvious my boss's boss had not told anybody I'd done the work. And I should tell you I'm Welsh, all right? And the Welsh and the Irish don't like this sort of behavior, and we tend to suicide. You know, if, if we feel we've been patronized or offended, to hell with the consequences, we'll go for it. So I went for it, right? <laughs> And the job is, I thought, and it was, I just thought of it. it was, I said, well, it's, it's a great way of working out who you're going to fire in your first six months of office. And there was this silence around the table, and you know, somebody very senior said, what do you mean by that, buddy? Uh, this has been said to me three times in America, and I now know what do you mean by it, buddy, is a danger sign. <laughs> yeah, it's like a rattlesnake, all right? You need to be aware of that. And I said, well, anybody who's changed their business plan from e this to on demand this in less than six months is obviously a sycophant, and they've just used the find and replace function to disguise what they're doing. Because if they really understood it, it would take them six months to adjust. The trouble is, everybody around the table had done precisely that because they were corporate suppliers. And, and three of them just giggled, and we were friends thereafter, right? Because <laughs> they knew they were playing the game. Anything explicit will be gained. Yeah, another fundamental rule. The minute you say, make something explicit, people will pretend to do what you, think they, what you think they want, and you won't get the results. It's kind of like a basic principle. Yeah? When you approach this from a complexity point of view, you do things which make a difference, then you claim success after the event. In fact, I make a general statement now, which I'm not going to go into much. In complexity, you start a journey with a sense of direction. You don't try and achieve goals. Because if you start a journey with a sense of direction, you can discover novelty on the pathway. If you have goals, you never do that. All right? So key fact number one is tropes. Key fact number two is this basically sensory response, is we match the patterns of past experience, and that's how we make decisions. And the third one is, for all of you with children now, just not teenage children, yeah, do you tell them bedtime stories? Okay, do you tell them stories about how Dick and Jane stayed at home, did what mummy and daddy said, achieved the family KPIs, yeah, and actually conformed their behavior with the family mission statement? Anybody do that? Right? <laughs> no, Dick and Jane go into the woods against mummy's and daddy's advice, and they meet witches and warlocks and evil things, all right? I mean, we have a happy ending because we do want them to sleep at night, 
but actually the vast majority of the story is negative, not positive. No? Uh, we now know from a cognitive neuroscience perspective, the brain pays more attention to failure than it pays attention to success. Because avoidance of failure is a more successful strategy than imitation of success in evolutionary terms. Yeah, that's why actually all human storytelling traditions tell negative stories, not positive stories. We now build worst practice systems for companies, not best practice systems. Because worst practice systems are much more interesting. Yeah, when we actually take managers through executives, the process goes down to a simulation, we take groups of executives through three rounds of simulation, in whatever they do, they fail. You can tell I watched Star Trek when I was young, you know, this is where this comes from. Right? I did my maths homework to it, right? To the first series. But basically, bas at the end of that process, if people have failed three times, they scan 30 times more data than if they succeed. Yeah, once you start to focus on best practice, you limit scanning because kind of like I've succeeded so I can forget about it. Whereas after you educate failure, things work in different ways. And so those are three key elements to understanding the way we handle narrative within organizations. Yeah? Any questions on that so far? So I'm conscious I've got 45 minutes and a lot to get through. And everybody comfortable on that? Anybody want to have an argument about it? I'm fairly happy to have arguments here. Okay. So what matters now? The other point about this is we're not talking about stories. I try and resist the word story. What we're talking about is micro-narratives. If you actually capture people's day-to-day -day stories, you might get one or two sentences, maybe a paragraph, you don't get a story. And I have a deep, intense objection to the organizational storytelling movement because you actually can't train people to tell stories in a two-day masterclass. Yeah? You make them, to quote Alistair McIntyre, anxious stutterers in their own, the story of their own existence. Right? Um, storytellers, if you take an Irish Sanaki, it's 10 years apprenticeship before they can tell a story. If you read Robert McKee's book on story, which is really worth it, it's out of print. He's a film writer. It takes four or five years before a script writer can really tell a story. Yeah, you can't get executives just to become storytellers overnight. You can, however, get them to recount anecdotes. And actually, executives do this are very powerful. They're not telling stories. They're giving anecdotes to illustrate what they're trying to talk about. And it's those day-to-day -day anecdotes which determine people's attitudes, not stories. Yeah. The other point is you don't want to do this in a workshop because people game it. What we want is the day-to-day -day stories. So I'll give you an extreme example of this in the corporate example. Now I'm going to go up and draw some pictures. Right? Sorry, it's way up there and I want to be down here. Yeah. Um, one of the big projects we're doing at the moment, which I've just been having a big conversation about because we're going to roll it out across Montessori schools in the States this year, is basically we've been working on getting children to be ethnographers to their own communities. And we've done this now in Wales, in Colombia, in Malmo, in Adelaide, and in Singapore. We're about to move this to a major international program. Now, just to tell you, I have an ambition by which I want every 16-year-old in every school in the world to be an ethnographer to their own communities. Because if I do that, I put a human buffering level into the internet. At the moment, the internet is an unbuffered feedback loop, and unbuffered feedback loops always produce perverse results. Yeah, think about the last major financial crash. That was computer trading algorithms without human buffering, yeah, and that's what you get. Yeah? So this is a big program. And the way it runs, it's run as school program, so it's 16 year olds every year. It satisfies educational needs because the teachers like it, because the kids can go and do community investigation. Yeah, they learn statistics, they learn interpretation, so it ticks in the box for teachers. And the basic work principle is the children go out as ethnographers to their own community. And the first question we normally ask, this is starts each project, first it is in Pakistan, is basically go to somebody in your parents and your grandparents' generation who you most admire and ask them for the stories of their lives that they think you should remember. Now, this is cultural anthropology. These are called sacred stories. So I'll give you my own illustration of that. If you ask me that, I'll tell you the story of my grandmother. Uh, my grandmother was the last in our family to speak Welsh as a native. Around about the turn of the last century, the English decided we should be educated, which is quite generous of them, really. 
Um, Welsh troops had English officers until the Second World War, so you know how we were treated, right? We're still a colony. You guys escaped. We're still a colony, right? Um, so either way, yeah? Um, so she, if she spoke Welsh in primary school, because the education had to be English, she had a wooden badge hung around her neck on which was burned WN, which stands for Welsh not. Then she had to catch one of her friends speaking Welsh and hand over the knot. And whoever wore the knot at the end of the day got thrashed by the teacher. Yeah? Everybody in Wales can tell you that story. Nobody in England even knows it happened. And there's actually an awful nursery rhyme we hate called Taffy was a Welshman, Taffy was a cheat. And it comes exactly from that, from that period. Now, if I tell that story in, for the Maori in New Zealand, if I tell it to First Nation people, they sit me down because exactly the same thing happened to them. But until you understand that, you don't understand why the single most important thing in Wales is that the English lose. Yeah, and literally it is, all right? I mean, it, it matters. I and mean, we got knocked out in the semi-final of the World Cup this year. It was unfair. We should have had a penalty. But it's okay because the English lost. <laughs> if, if, if they'd won, it would have been insufferable, all right? Now, I give you that as a comical example, but actually that's how you understand nations. So some of the work we're doing on peace and reconciliation in Latin America is about understanding the defining stories which are known to one side but not known to the other, which form part of this underlying substrate or belief system. It's called an ideation culture in anthropology. It's something which isn't explicit, which isn't stated, but everybody understands. Yeah, so you see what we're doing with that, and then next week, they can go and find somebody living on their own without care, and they can gather their stories. So what we're doing is we're making people ethnographers to their own condition. We're not bringing in outside consultants because they're biased. We're not moving people into workshops. There's a massive criticism at the moment of government research centers. Everybody do these? Government innovation centers? Yeah, because actually what's been discovered when we investigate it is they just attract the usual suspects. They attract people who match the cultural expectation of the facilitation team. Yeah, they don't get into the deep, you know, the, the people who really need to be there. What we found with distributed ethnography is you get what we call in the UK hoodies. Anybody know that phrase over here? These are, these are kids who are outside society. They wear hooded jackets. They sort of slump around. They will engage as ethnographers. And the key thing about this is and what we developed is the person who tells the story interprets their own story. That's really important. That's a power transfer issue. Because if you capture somebody's stories, but you or an AI system interpret it, you've lost agency. If you allow people to interpret their own story, that's far more powerful. And we found that, for example, in the narrative work we're doing in hospitals. If patients can keep journals of their stay through hospital, and they can interpret their own stories, then they get agency back, and that improves their journey back to health. Yeah, agency is really important in human systems. Yeah? So I'm giving that as an illustration. Now you notice what I'm also doing here is I'm creating a human sensor network. If I've got every kid at the age of 16 in an area gathering stories every month, I've got a sensor network which no other mechanism can actually imitate. Yeah? Because now also I can activate that network. So this is kind of like where we move on on this and we put questions to the network which they index in real time. So this is kind of, I'm going to draw the picture on this in a minute. If I can go to all of my workforce, and I can say this is something we're considering as a board, everybody can interpret that and get the result back within half an hour, I'm deploying knowledge. Yeah? I'm not actually building knowledge in advance because you can't do that. What I'm doing is I'm creating a cognitively diverse group of people who can answer questions in real time and from which I can identify outliers. Yeah. This comes back to another key fact on this. You may know this. Um, if you take radiologists, you give them a batch of x-rays, you ask them to identify outliers or anomalies in the x-rays. On the final x-ray, you put a picture of a gorilla, which is 48 times the size of a cancer nodule. 83% of radiologists don't see it, even though their eyes scan it. Yeah. And with that, I've just invalidated any process based on interviews, workshops, expert assessment, systems analysis. We fundamentally, we do not see what we do not expect to see. We didn't evolve to make decisions as individuals. That's kind of like a Northern European, North American mistake. We actually evolved to make decisions in clans and extended families. 
because clans have cognitive diversity within the system. So somebody in the system will see things that the other people aren't seeing. This is stuff I'm teaching at Quantico next week, right? Is how do we do collective decision making, not individual decision making? How do we shift away from individual leadership to collective leadership? Because anything based on individuals is actually fundamentally flawed in terms of cognitive neuroscience. We didn't evolve for that. Okay? Right. So to illustrate this and go through some patterns, yeah. So this is also the new work we've done on design thinking. So first of all, I just need to explain how we do what's called high abstraction metadata. And another key factor, if you didn't know it, is LARP comes before language in human evolution. So we learned to paint and to create music before we developed language. And that probably was an accident when it didn't happen, like everything else is in evolution, but then it produced very valuable. Because if you go up a level of abstraction, you make novel connections. So a lot of human resilience is our ability to make connections between things which are apparently unconnected. And that in logic is called abduction, not induction. We're actually quite good at abduction, we're very poor at induction. Right? And if you think about it in evolutionary terms, it's the ability to suddenly rework something which is critical. IBM repurposed punch card technology to give themselves early dominance in computers. Yeah, microwave ovens are because somebody repurposed the magneto of a radar machine. Most human evolution is radical repurposing and it turns out what abstraction allows us to do is to see those novel connections. So if you focus on STEM education, you're actually damaging human inventiveness. It's actually right scary when people are looking at this. We, we didn't evolve to be engineers. We evolved for engineers to be a sub-part of our species, but not the entirety of the species. You need art as well. Art is critical to human innovation. Yeah? So this is a high abstraction metadata set. So you all at some stage, I presume, yeah, have handled an employee satisfaction survey. Ever we done one of those? Okay, so we got one of these in IBM, all right? And it came to me and it said, does your manager consult you on a regular basis, scale of zero, not at all, 10 all the time? Everybody familiar with that one? So I was in a slightly wicked mood because we were researching it, so I phoned up HR. Um, I got put straight, straight through to our monk. You need to understand I was on a watch list in IBM. I just completed a six-month program which had proved that Myers-Briggs was less accurate than astrology in predicting team behavior, <laughs> and HR had paid me to do it, and for some reason they were irritated, all right? Um, so either way, so I got straight through to the woman at the top, all right? And I said, how am I meant to answer this? I've got several managers. Sometimes they consult me, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they should, and sometimes they shouldn't. You're asking me a context-free question in a context-specific world. Now, this is one of the big problems we've got all those sort of approaches. And she said, average your experience over the year and stop making trouble and slam the phone down just before she could hear me saying, you call yourself HR in the research group, right? And she may have heard me, but she decided not to, all right? Um, either way, we take a different approach. We'll go to, say, 10% of the workforce every month and say, what story would you tell your best friend if they were offered a job in the workplace? Yeah, that's a con that's a called a hypothesis-free question. There's no hypothesis in it, and it creates rich context. And then we say, in this story, okay, that's wrong color. we basically give people a series of triangles, normally about six, and one of the triangles, for example, says, in this story, the manager was altruistic, assertive, analytical. It is and it's not. Okay, the system broke again. Okay, so I'll have to describe it, right? That means I can come down again. Actually, that's a real pain. Um, it was shown when I showed it earlier, but it isn't now. Let's just see if Keynote works. No, okay. Right, I'm gonna, you have to rely on my oral testimony on this one, right? So what we do is we give people a series of triangles and we say, where does your story fit on these triangles? And one of the triangles is altruistic, assertive, analytical. Got the picture? There are three positive qualities. What that means is the human brain doesn't know what answer you want. And that's really important. Because it actually triggers, we wire people up for this. We, it moves people from autonomic to novelty receptive processing. Or if you want the simplistic version from economists, from thinking fast to thinking slow. There's actually a better explanation than that, and that's what I'm referencing. 
because that triggers people into deeper attitudinal studies. So with six triangles, I've got 18 data points. I can do some powerful stuff with that. Yeah? What's also interesting is it turns out people add layers of meaning to their narrative. They don't interpret the narrative, which actually means text-based and analytics and experts don't work. Yeah? Because but the narrative acts as a cognitive trigger, the structure you give them allows them to self-interpret their own experience, and it's always different. Right, now, that allows me to scale to very large volume very quickly. Yeah, and that's a critical aspect of this approach. It also, as I say, gives people power to do the core interpretation. Yeah. So in an employee satisfaction survey, I can now actually look at attitudes. And attitudes are lead indicators. Compliance is a lag indicator. Yeah. Uh, anybody done 360? I'll give that as an illustration as well. Uh, everybody not learned to game it yet? The other thing I did in IBM, which HR hadn't quite, still haven't forgiven me for, is we set up a website where you could nominate yourself to be somebody else's third quartile responder and told the range of the response, which ensure the HR wouldn't realize you'd fake the system. Right? For some reason, they objected to that as well. Right? Again, we take a different approach because every year of 360 is evaluative and it's traumatic. We actually say to any manager, nominate any number of people who work for you, Every time they interact with you, get them to describe the interaction. Then they index the interaction onto six triangles with only positive qualities. So no evaluation, no description, only positive. But then you basically see, well, last week, I've been all altruistic, analytical. Yeah, I haven't been assertive at all, so I need to rebalance. And that question of rebalancing is key. So that's the key approach. Now, you can now see how we do it. And I, I need to draw, I'm going to have to listen to Okay, two by two matrix. Everybody can imagine a two by two matrix? Okay, I really want to draw this, but I can't, all right? Okay, so basically what I've got is on one line, I've got, and this is the new approach we've got to design thinking. Anybody done design thinking yet? Yeah, it's become heavily commoditized the last couple of years. Yeah, and heavily rejected by most design professors, right? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've, my cousin's son has actually got a degree in archeology, span in um, architecture. Yeah, he did five years at Cambridge University, three years of practice, four years at Harvard, five years, and now he's allowed to design houses. The idea you can become a designer by going on a two-day course and getting a certificate from a day is kind of like, to me, absurd, right? <laughs> uh, but the certificate industry is a major problem worldwide at the moment, right? So either way, what I've got is on one dimension, I've got ethnography, how we discover things. On the other direction, I've got the ideation, how we create ideas. Okay. And the dimensions are expert against distributed. So if I go expert, it, expert ideation, expert ethnography, that's a deo. Yeah, we gather data, we do ethnography, we listen to people, we come up with ideas, that's a linear process. Nothing wrong with that. It's actually quite good for product creation where the product, the product need is roughly known. It's poor outside that. And then move into basically Distributed ethnography, yeah, expert ideation. This is called unarticulated need management. And actually, that's one of the big things for knowledge management to address. Because technology can now do things that people don't know what to ask for. Yeah, very few people know how to produce a requirement spec for what technology can now do. Because actually, technology has progressed too quickly for that. If we, on the other hand, can gather people's day-to-day -day frustrations over four or five months, we can produce clusters from that. We can give those clusters to a pair programming team and say, produce a prototype. Right? And that's called managing unarticulated need. Right? So that's you distribute the ethnography, the capture of need. You centralize or make expert the interpretation of what that means. You then got the one I've already talked about in which you have an expert defined problem. Your executive has got a big issue. You put it together as an infographic with positive and negative qualities so you don't have to declare what you're looking for. You then distribute that to the whole of your workforce, and one hour later, you get a result. And next day, you can give them the results back and ask for secondary commentary. And the way we, map, we show how that works is by contour maps. These are called fitness landscapes. So everybody can imagine a contour map. Okay, so you've got a landscape like this. If you've got densely packed contours, that's a pattern of interpretation or a trope, going back to where I started, which will be impossible to disrupt. If the contours are actually broadly drawn, 
then you can probably pull things away from it. Also, what you'll find is outlier clusters. Remember the 17% who see a gorilla? This shows up the people who are thinking differently before they talk to the other people. So for an executive point, that's critical. I can see the dominant views. I can see outlier views. I can actually go and investigate those because that's strategic surprise and strategic opportunity. And that's called mass sense. Yeah? That's actually quite important. We're doing that now, for example, to measure attitudes to cybersecurity. Uh, we're doing it for real-time strategic assessment under conditions of uncertainty. It comes back to what the description of this thing is about. What I want is the ability to deploy a cognitively diverse network in real time without having to declare what I'm worried about or what I'm looking for. Yeah? And then the final one, because you know the really fun stuff, is going to be in the top right-hand box of the matrix, because it always is. Uh, this is actually called um, uh, exaptive learning. Now, I need to check, all right? Uh, people know the word exaptation? Probably not. It's a neologism. Okay. So adaptation yeah, is a dinosaur's feathers. And by the way, if you've got kids who like dinosaurs, you've now got one up on them because their books aren't up to date. Yeah, all dinosaurs had feathers. Yeah, we know that from discoveries in northern China. We know from X-ray scattering that the dinosaur's feathers were colored. Yeah? And so basically, the only obvious solution for this is feathers evolved for sexual display. Yeah? There's no need for warmth or anything. This is a sexual display mechanism, classic. And some dinosaurs, I forgot the name of it now, started to develop skin flaps, which meant they could better display the feathers. Those dinosaurs fell off cliffs and glided. Yeah? You couldn't actually have feathers evolve for flight in a linear way, because if dinosaurs flung themselves off cliffs in the hope of evolving feathers before they hit the ground, it wouldn't work. <laughs> so under conditions of stress, a trait which evolves for one function adapts for one function, accepts for something completely different. The other one I love, by the way, is the cerebellum at the base of your brain evolved in higher apes to manipulate muscles in fingers. It accepts in humans to manage grammar in human language. The huge sophistication of human language wasn't possible to evolve in a linear way. It required a nonlinear change. And I give you the examples of microwave ovens and IBM. This is called exaptive learning. So this is where we take distributed ideation and distributed ethnography, I, everything we know we can do stored at the right level of granularity, and we throw it together with distributed problems. And when we get clusters, we say, why is that thing coinciding with this thing? So I'll give you two stories to illustrate this. We did this with one of the major companies in Europe, and they had this belief that if you bought lights to light your garden, to be a garden feature, they had a second market. Up to that time, people bought lights to light gardens. They didn't see lights as a garden feature. So we pulled in 3,000 stories over a couple of weeks from people about their gardens. We didn't ask them about light. That was hidden in the triangles. Yeah, we're looking to see whether things occur naturally, not whether they occur promptly. We then got the company indexed every single one of their core technologies yeah, using the same signifier structure. And then we mashed the databases together, and we got five clusters. Three of those became major businesses. The one I'm particularly ashamed of, uh, there's actually a colored rock you can buy for your garden in the Southeast Asia. The colors are garish. It's entirely based on a technology it originally developed in Holland to manage you know, control on staircases saturated by male urine. All right? And that was actually accepted into a garden feature. You see the point I'm making here? Yeah. So that's kind of like one story. So that's kind of like where we're now starting to work, is you need to start to deploy your workforce and your networks as an asset in real time, rather than trying to capture their knowledge in a stored way, which will never be up to date. This is also very powerful in terms of persuading people to change. So a final story in this, we did one on um, the Royal Australian Air Force. And they had a major problem in the engineering officers were buying themselves out of service after 18 months. Now, if you know your military, you know this is a disaster because it takes you two years to train them. You want five years service, right? So they were buying themselves out. So we pulled in 3,000 stories from officers and spouses of officers over four days. Spouses are really good when you work in military environments, all right? They, they really tell you the truth, all right? Um, so we gathered those stories. And when we looked at the data, we had an absolute correlation between willingness to lead the Air Force, poor leadership, 
and recent implementation of Lean Six Sigma. Now, the chief of the Air Force had insisted on having which major project is your story associated with. Well, he, did, he regretted this, all right? Now, he's not happy with this, but he has to pay attention to it. So he looks at a squadron leader at the bottom of the table. Squadron leader in Britain is kind of like a lieutenant equivalent. And he says, we, by which he means you, haven't communicated our, by which he means my, Lean Six Sigma probably policy properly. This is a classic senior management response. They don't like it. It's your fault for not communicating it. And so he does that. And we say, well, we don't know. Why don't you look at the data? So he looks at the data. Now, the prompting question we used for this was imagine you're a grandparent and your grandchild says they want to join the Air Force. What story will you tell them? You see the non-hypothesis base? The first story on the correlation was a one-liner, I'll shoot them first and they'll be grateful. <laughs> and he looks at this and he said, that's some disgruntled gun officer. We said, we don't know, check the demographics. 30-year service warrant officer. Now, if you know your armed forces, you know at this point the table went very, very silent. And he tentatively clicked on the next one, and the name of the story, names are often significant, was why do we have to shit under the trees? These are Australians. Yeah, it's a two-paragraph story, yeah? New Air Force base set up in the Red Desert. Uh, the bureaucracy of Six Sigma means they haven't got a mobile latrine, but they've had to deploy anyway, so they're having to dig holes in the ground. Now, it's bad enough in Virginia, right? But things live in holes in the ground in Australia. You don't want the unsighted bare skin. You know, they're eight of the world's ten most poisonous snakes, three of the world's four most poisonous spiders, and don't get me onto the centipedes, all right? And so he looked at this, all right, and he got up from the table, walked to his desk, and he had a quiet, assertive conversation with somebody. Yeah, and this was quite significant, right? Quiet, assertive in military terms is very scary. Shouting is okay. And over the next hour or so, mobile latrines were flown into the base <laughs> to the point where the sergeant had a surplus and sold them on the internal black market. Right? This is, those of you old enough, this is Sergeant Bilko, if you go back to that time. <laughs> then he came and sat down at the table. He said, we've taken Six Sigma too far. Now, that me was really significant. He worked it out for himself. He couldn't challenge 3,000 stories told and interpreted by his own staff. He couldn't challenge the statistics but the story gave him an explanation for what the statistics meant, so he changed. And that's what we talk about building advocacy into the research method. Because actually, one of the big problems you've got as knowledge management managers is getting executives to change. Yeah, and just actually knowing you're right isn't good enough. So what I've tried to do, and you should now see how we count, if we count negative stories, if we're capturing stories regularly from our staff, we find the stories before they come attract us. We can then disrupt them. We can find other stories near to the negative story and go to our executives and say, we want more stories like these and fewer stories like those. So we've got a fast response mechanism. And that's the stuff we're also doing on the national level. OK. I've left a couple of minutes for questions. And I'm sorry I couldn't draw any pictures. Anything. Yes, Stan? You caught the center of my other. Yeah? When you talk about the uh, people being able to interpret the narratives themselves, what, is, what does that mean? OK, so I tell a story, all right? And if we do this properly, you can take a picture. So for example, with a nurse, they can take a picture of a patient, they can write something, and they can record the patient's story. That together is what we call a micro-narrative. Yeah? Then they basically say where it sits on, three, on six triangles. Or another one we use there, we've got a scale which goes empathy, pain. And they place markers on that to say, this is how I see it. This is how I think the nursing staff think I see it. This is how the doctor sees it, thinks I see it. That actually is really powerful for doctors. They love this. Because pain and empathy charts over time are better than self-reporting. So it's self-interpreted at the point of origin, which means it's real-time data. Yeah? Any more? Because we're actually on time. OK, I'm sorry you didn't get any slides from that, all right? I will try and put some up on the website. Yeah? Because um, I've used some of the things at different talks. But it's fairly easy to look at this sort of stuff, all right? key thing to remember is it's people's day-to-day -day stories that count. It's how they interpret them that count. And you can't actually declare a purpose. You have to actually manage directions of travel. Uh, and if you don't want one final one, uh, you can have the scientific evidence on this. Whenever people are working for explicit targets, it destroys intrinsic motivation. There is no scientific evidence whatsoever to contradict that. It's well known. It's established. It's published. So the minute you put in explicit targets, you've just destroyed intrinsic motivation. 
and just think about the areas of our life where we most need intrinsic motivation, where do we have the highest numbers of targets? Okay, guys, thanks very much for your time.